How you doing, guys? Eric from RuleTheWasteland.com, rocking the Killdozer shirt. Let freedom roll. If you like these, you can check them out at RuleTheWasteland.com. What's up to Mark from Southern, sunny Southern California? This uh, video is going to be about some of my goals for the past year and whether I made them or not. Spoiler alert, I failed at most of them. <laughs> not necessarily miserably. Um, some goals for 2020, coming year, and the latest battle box which I just did a video on that because I forgot to do that one. This one I just got not that long ago. So this is actually December that so I will be doing. What's up, Seaway? What's up, the Unmasked Magician? So first, really quick, I will get into the um, goals for 2019 that I made. I don't have them all written down in front of me, which is fine because I didn't <laughs> get to most of them anyway. And there's one major reason for that. The main reason is most of the goals that I did accomplish were some of my like personal financial goals and things like that, which weren't that um, uh, aggressive anyway. But at the time that I made that video and made those specific goals, I was still just trying to um, work exclusively for myself online, didn't have a full-time job, which made it much more difficult to do the financial goals because but it much, gave me much more time to do the rest of them. So when I made most of those, it was under the assumption that I would have the same amount of free time that I did when I made that video. I ended up getting a full-time job not that long after that, within a month or two, I think less than two months. So that made it much easier to have steady stream of income coming in, but it gave me way, way, way less time to do a bunch of the other things. And like I mentioned in my mat, that last video, I just kind of have to accept that for the time being, I can't do with certain things um, like the jujitsu and everything until I find some time, I have to give up something else to do it right now. I want to focus on doing the side hustle stuff and try to make a few bucks, put myself in a good position for the next few years before I can worry about that. So I did start doing the jujitsu again last year, but I didn't get to nearly as many classes as I want to only was able to do it for a couple of months. And um, I was the, the one that I'm disappointed with though, that I didn't reach it's the stuff like reading all the books that I wanted to, didn't get that done stuff like, um, learning as much Spanish as I wanted to, didn't get, get all those done as much as I wanted to, but the fitness stuff I still could have done. I really just slacked off on most of those. None of them. I think that I actually meet the goals, which were, you know, not super aggressive, but they weren't uh, really easy either, but I did manage to maintain. I don't think I've lost ground in any of those areas, which is good, especially considering how inconsistent I was for the, over the year for my workouts. I was really good in like a couple bursts, but that's not the best way to do it. You've got to be consistent throughout the whole year. So that's my goal for the next one. So just to give you guys a, um, I thought I had a glass of water in here. Oh, well, the, a few of the things I wanted to get to was a 285 bench and uh, like a 185 overhead press, somewhere around a 300 squat and like a 375 deadlift. Um, those are going to be my goals again for this year because it's so up clay because I didn't get those on the last year, but I did maintain, didn't, I can st still hit the uh, maximum one rep max that I got for the last year and everything. So those are still my goals for next year. I, um, for the side hustle stuff, like with my survival fishing kits, I think I said I want to sell 300 of these. I did very, very little promotion and I also was very bad about making videos for like the past few months. I still managed to sell exactly, I think, or nearly 150, I think it was 144 to 148, somewhere along those lines of the survival fishing kits. And um, so that's pretty decent. I think I'm gonna try and get like 400 this year, which is just over one a day. I think if I get back into making the videos regularly, add in a little bit of uh, advertising and stuff like that, I really think I can do that. Same with selling these shirts. Speaking of which, I'm looking to get some new pictures made for some of these products, especially the shirts. So if any of you guys know, any females who could stretch out a size small killdozer shirt in all the right places, just have them send me an email at rulewasteland at gmail.com if you want to get some pictures taken and uh, send them some a little bit of sweet coin. But yeah, so um, for uh, prepping goals, I just want to be able to keep doing practice shooting at least once a month, which I've been doing for the past few months, so that's good. Uh, I want to add at least one more water storage barrel or IBC tote and rain catchment. Beyond that, most of my goals are organizational in terms of literally getting my gear together, staging it, things like that. For the most part, I need to add a little bit more food storage as well and um, to get myself 
right up to that six month point that I've talked about before for two people. And, but beyond that, I'm pretty good, pretty happy with what I have. It's just not organized. So that's my big things, getting organized and topping off the food to where I need to be. I have great ability to do the cooking, to do um, a protection, I've got decent first aid supplies, decent um, ability to produce light, to stay warm, to do all these different things that I need to do, hygiene products, all that stuff. I have pretty much everything I need for a uh, six months of being, you know, doing without outside system support. And like a six month grid down, but even if the grid was completely down for six months, I'm pretty much almost there in terms of, I mean, I have enough water to literally survive in terms of just stored water. And I want to get that up to just where I have enough to also do a little bit other things other than strictly just drinking, you know, a little bit of washing clothes, a little bit of cleaning uh, yourself, things like that. So a little bit more water storage, rain catchment, things like that. But um, I pretty much am, am happy with a lot of where I'm at, you know, other than beyond where I'm at now, it's just in making life even easier during the six months. It's no longer about surviving. I have everything I need to survive with the possible exception. Like I said, probably don't have quite enough food to literally go six months with two people, but I'm getting close to so need to just top that off. And that's pretty much it. And I'll be happy. Zombies average 140 pounds. Okay. I'll take them out no matter what, whether 140, 180, I don't care. Physically, other than the benchmarks that I'm trying to get to for my lifts, I just kind of want to achieve my ultimate form physically, you know, at least just touch the sun for a few months before I can just maintain, you know what I mean? Just get freaking shredded and everything. But uh, that's pretty much it, man. Failed pretty miserably on, on actually getting all those um, uh, physical benchmarks and prepping benchmarks for this year. One for um, my uh, gold and silver stuff, I did get that benchmark last year. I forget exactly what it was that I said I was going to do, but I think I blew past it in terms of the uh, gold and silver, adding it to my collection. My, I want to shore away my finances just in general, not specifically rate related to gold and silver and try to um, actually produce more, use that money to get some kind of income producing assets as well. So my gold and silver goals for next year are a little bit more modest. I just want to add one and a half ounces of gold and like 70 ounces of silver. And, um, I'll hopefully do more than that, but that's just like my bare minimum for the year. And uh, then I want to be a lot stingier. I've been spending too much money on restaurants and drinks and things like that. So I'm going to cut that back down to help meet these other goals. And um, I want to be doing a lot more giveaways on the channel. I've got a lot of cool gear, stuff from BattleBox and other places that even though I like it and it's great, I don't necessarily need it or I already have some other version of it, like you know, extra knives and things like that. So I'm going to be giving away a lot of stuff and um, stay tuned for that and get on the email list for sure. Other than that, let's get into this month's battle box. If you guys have any questions or anything like that, pop them down into the chat. Hit the like button while you're at it. Got my box here. This one's not as heavy as last time, but it is beefier. So we got our spider toe. I'm gonna pop this bad boy open, see what we got. Also, do you guys have any decent movies you've seen? Because I'm going to plan on doing more of those for the survival and prepping related breakdowns, lessons that can be learned from decent movies. I just rewatched the old movie, uh, No Lead of Leaves of Grass or No Blade of Grass. I forget the exact title, but it's a pretty decent, if not a bit cheesy, um, really old school, I think 70s survival movie about global food crisis, economic collapse, that sort of thing. And uh, it's pretty interesting, though. It touches on some cool stuff. Pretty uh, similar feel to something like um, Panic in Year Zero, just because that's uh, the same era, generally, that it was made. All right, so Battle Box, let's see what we got in here in this one. This is the December version. We Knife. What do you think this is? We Knife. Read the instructions before opening or using the knife inside. Well, the instructions are not on the outside of the box, so I don't think they mean before opening this part. But if they do, too bad, because there's no instructions. See, we got Wee Knife from Battle Box. Still no instructions. Got a little pouch. It says WeeKnife.com on it. It's got a little uh, terry cloth rag. Got a little sticker. 
interesting look to it. Pretty cool rubberized feeling, quick release. So I know, right? There we go. Almost like a fillet knife blade. Pretty cool looking. Definitely very sharp. I like it. Liner lock. We knife Civivi. I don't know if that's the name of the knife or what. Pretty cool little carrying pouch. A bit more for storage and actually has space for a, another knife in there as well on this side. Or sharpening stone, anything like that. Pretty cool. So that was the first item from the December Battle Box. It's the Wii Knife. Next up, we got something in a leather pouch. Feels a little bit beefy. Looks like some kind of handle or something. What's up, Big Sexy? <laughs> How you doing, JJ? It's been a while, man. I've been liking this, or I'm happy to have seen you back on the uh, YouTubes recently. Checked out a few of your videos. Oh, this is looks like a combination of some kind of hole saw or auger bit with even like a punch or something like that on the other end. Seems snagged on the plastic. So here we go. So this is some kind of giant auger bit, and then it actually has a hammer punch. So I'm wondering if this is one of those things to make like that, um, where you make a rocket stove out of a log. This is just called a settler's wrench. Pretty cool. It's called Helton Forged. I'll have to look up the specifics on what this is expected to be used for. It is not a butt plug, sorry guy. <laughs> Although, uh, Maybe it is if you're brave enough. I guess anything is if you're brave enough, right? If you believe in yourself. So that's pretty cool. Looks like a little hammer. It's got an angled punch and then the auger bit. I'm the illest bulletproof. I die harder than Bruce Willis. Okay, cool. Let's see the rest of those rhymes. You need something else too. Shame they're using Chinese knives. Is that Chinese? I'm not sure. Not everything that's made in China is garbage, but review the 1983 movie The Day After. Okay, yeah, that, I'll put that on the list. Flow like water, my friend. Appreciate it. It's a wee knife lad. Yeah. What's up? Let's talk about prepping. I've been missing a lot of your videos lately, man. I just watched part of the um, one of the latest ones you did, but good to see you on here. What's up, Brian? As usual, happy new year to use you as well. So I'm gonna have to look up that settler's wrench, see exactly what that kind of stuff is used for. Here we have a safe box, locking valuable storage, battle box branded. Secure valuables with confidence, ideal for safeguarding items such as jewelry, cash, small firearms, important documents, and more. I think these are good for firearms. The, the um, I would disagree that they're necessarily good for, for valuables in that sense, because let me give you, take a guess as to why I wouldn't put cash or valuables in here or anything that I'm just trying to stop it from theft specifically. I think the utility of these locking boxes like this is specifically to keep firearms or knives or something dangerous accessible, but or, or you know, close by but inaccessible to children. Um, I don't think they're particularly good for just storing valuables because you could just grab it and carry it off and spend as much time as you want cracking it open later. So having this sitting there isn't really protecting your items from being stolen, whether it's a gun or cash or jewelry or whatever. It is simply making it so that it's difficult to physically touch it. So I think the utility, and it is a great um, utility, is to stop someone just from being able to grab it and, and uh, mess with it, whether it's a roommate or a child or something like that, just mixed company or whatever. It doesn't really protect it from being stolen because it's just too small and just too easy to take with you. But it is great for just making something you know, nearby but unable to be molested. So that is a battle box, safe box, pretty cool. Does it have a cable lock? I don't know. And that's the thing, too. If it has a cable lock, you can sometimes have a, the ability to run a cable. It does have holes in it, or one little hole there, which I believe is probably for a cable lock. If I pop it open, we'll see. I'll, I'll crack it open, see if it has a cable lock in the inside. And if it does, then that is one way to make it 
much more difficult to literally carry it off. So then in that case, it could be used for it. It does. Yeah. So that, that would prevent it from being simply carried off. But it's, again, it's not that hard to bust a cable versus a safe or something like that. But if that's, you know, you just have something you need to put it in, maybe in your car and the glove box obviously isn't that secure. You can put it in this, have the cable lock go around some metal part of a um, frame of a seat or something like that, some or a roll cage if you have it. And uh, <laughs> I can bypass a cable lock with my morning breath. Yeah, like I said, they're not that, it's not that difficult to get through a cable like this any more than it is to get through a padlock or something like that. But it does require at least some tools, some, you know, junkie is not going to smash your window and just grab it and run off. It would at least take someone with much more um, forethought or planning, something like that. So it's at least another step. There's nothing that you can do to make something impervious to theft or vandalism or anything like that, but you can make it significantly more difficult and take significantly more time, which that alone prevent most of uh, your problems. New box. This is, yeah, this is the December one. Child proof, idiot proof safe. Yeah, exactly. And that's what I mentioned before. I use a similar box. My truck pistol works well, but not crazy secure. Yeah, exactly. But it's going to stop someone who just breaks in and, you know, looks around real quick from grabbing it and running off with it. And uh, you're just not always going to have a time where you can just totally secure everything. Sometimes you just need to, you know, maybe you're concealed carrying, you would have it on your person, but you end up having to go to an airport or a courthouse or a school or something like that, a post office even, and you just can't take your weapons in with you and you don't just want to leave them in the glove box, even if that locks, something like that's a good um, compromise, so to speak. And it will still offer pretty decent level of protection. Like I said, it's not, not every, there's not that many people that are ready to just blast through a cable lock, even if it's um, not that difficult. In your opinion, what will, will there be a world crisis in 2020? I have no idea. I mean, to some extent, you could just say yes, simply because there's always world crises. There's world crises happening right now, and just depends on will there be any that, that significantly impact us here in the United States? I don't know. I mean, I think there's, of course, a chance of an economic collapse or a significant economic downturn, I think, put it that way. I've seen this get pushed way past beyond what I ever would have thought possible in terms of the national debt and just the um, the weakness and just utter um, kind of uh, fraud prodigy, <laughs> fakeness of the core of the economy, basically just structurally everything is doomed, but that doesn't mean that anything could, has to happen significantly within the next year or two. Um, there's no reason, you know, if there, is, if there isn't a reason why we couldn't go from 10 to 20 trillion of debt, there technically isn't a reason why we can't get to 50 or 75 trillion. The money will just be increasingly less uh, significant, but we're still going in that direction. It's eventually gonna happen. And it might not be catastrophic. It might just turn us into a second class country where we're used to being at the top. But something like that's gonna happen eventually. I think we're gonna see a little bit of stability at least until barring you know black swan event that we can't predict anyway. Um, people are waiting to see what happens with the election. I think after the election, there's gonna be um, where I do, I am predicting that if, unless something significantly different happens that Trump will be reelected. I haven't really spoken on that before, but if you go back, I pretty much nailed the um my election predictions for 2016 i even got to within like three or four electoral college votes i was very very close i've got it almost exactly right which states would go and whatnot in the total but um i think we'll see a little bit of stability until um after the election and then who knows what will happen in the next four years i'd be very i would personally be very surprised if we got to 2024 without a significant economic downturn, let's put it that way. I wouldn't be that surprised if we got through 2020 or got near the end of 2020, but it's certainly possible because there's so many things that could happen that really don't even have anything to do with the United States. But if something happens in another country first, we're actually likely to see, in my opinion, the US dollar get um, temporarily strengthened as everyone goes there instead. But long term, it's it's doomed just like all the other fiat currencies. But what is the question is what is long term? So I don't know. People break stuff. You come prepared to break into stuff. Yeah, I mean to break things, but it's not that easy to get through a uh, cable locks and a locked box and all that stuff. Especially if the cable is short. Like I would recommend that if you put a cable lock on something like that, 
if you make the cable lock so short that you can't even pull the box out from under the seat, then it'll be incredibly difficult to, to clip that cable because not only is your car probably locked, so they have to probably break out another window, crawl under the seat with bolt cutters or some kind of angle grinder or something like that, or at least big snips. And uh, it's going to look really suspicious. It's going to take longer. And if you're in, an, unless they have a lot of time and, um, or really don't care about getting caught, that'll make it pretty difficult. If you can't even pull that little box out from under the seat, then um, it would be much more difficult. So I could put cocaine in it and it should be safe. You should be good to go. They are releasing chaos in 2020 just to be prepared and react better. I mean, if you're talking about like um, deep state type stuff, they're out of bullets, man. I mean, they're doing whatever they can already. They've been doing whatever they can. And actually they're, they're getting very desperate. So of course they could try to do some crazy stuff, but what else could they possibly do? Thank you very much, Tom. I appreciate the support very much. Happy New Year to you as well. Some Bronco gas. Man, I actually do appreciate it. The thing has a 32-gallon gas tank, and it doesn't get terrible gas mileage. <clears throat> Somewhere around 15. You know, it's terrible by today's standards. But filling up 30 gallons at once does take a bite out of the old wallet. So I definitely appreciate it. Um, White Phillip, who's my Bronco. And I've actually got his little sacred text right here. Because I was doing a little flush of the coolant system, and I'm going to replace the thermostat. I've been having issues with the um, the heater does not blow hot almost at all, and I don't think there's a heater control valve on there in the traditional sense. I couldn't find it, and I looked it up, and it doesn't look like all of them do have one. But so I don't. It's I don't think it's that. <clears throat> the heater core doesn't appear to be leaking or anything. It's um, the blend doors seems like it's working. The blower works. So pretty much narrowed it down to. Um, blocked or clogged heater core. And um, cause I have two hoses going into the heater core, the intake one warmed up decently and the other one didn't get warm at all. So yeah, exactly. Clogged heater core is my guess. And um, I just added some coolant flush in there. I'm gonna let it be in the system for a few hours of driving around. And then I'm going to do another drain, flush the heater core and replace the thermostat cause it could also be stuck open. And, and or stuck open. It's like nine dollars to get a new thermostat, so not a big deal. I'll replace that, and uh, we'll see where we're at then. So yeah, White Philip appreciates it. So the next item from the battle box is a Lord and Fio. It's a brand, and I don't know if they created this brand, or I think they did because you really can't find it anywhere. It's really cool, kind of like um, heritage style gear. Lots of leather, lots of metal. Really classic look to it, which I kind of appreciate. Kind of cool, masculine, outdoorsy trapper vibes. This is a, a striker with a cool leather kind of fob on it and a flint or ferrosium rather um, kind of uh, toggle. I don't know if you'd call it that. So you can make this into a necklace, almost like a bolo tie. Pretty cool striker there. The handle on the settler's hammer can be used as a hand drill by the looks of the handle. Yeah, that would be my guess too. You could put a pole or a stick through that hollow part right here and use it to get leverage and um but like i said with the, with a hole that big um i would venture to guess you're either making i mean you could do all sorts of stuff with it obviously but it would work pretty well if you drill when you drill holes in the side and through and you can actually turn a whole log basically into a self-immolating rocket stove which is pretty cool i'm not sure exactly what the purpose of that punch would be Specifically, I mean, obviously, you can come up with all sorts of stuff, punching holes in leather or whatever. But pretty cool. So that's the next battle box item. And Bastion is another brand that they have for. Oh, this is a cool knife. Two knives in this one, and they're both slim style. This is almost like a acrylic, or it's almost translucent. I don't know if you can tell that, but it has kind of a translucent look to it. Again, it has an assisted opening kind of thing on there. Very uh, slim, almost like fillet knife style blade. Also looks very sharp, also line or lock. It seems to be a popular style of knife for the battle box recently, and I don't have a problem with it. I dig this. These are probably pretty decent for self-defense in terms of the stabbing power. And they're just sleek in general, very thin, but also very sharp, lightweight, cool stuff. And then also, I think that's the last item, we have a Really cool battle again, battle box branded with some embroidering. Uh, assault pack is what I would call this day pack, something like that. 
It looks like you can open up to like a clamshell style, which is pretty cool. Haven't seen that before. That could actually really come in handy. But one of the things I've noticed when going camping is it having any sort of like duffel bag style pack or backpack, even typical style, can lead to you having to take all your gear out sometimes to get to the stuff at the bottom. So when you have this clamshell style zip front where you can literally just split the whole bag open, you could um, get to everything very readily available. Might be good for different types of gear, like maybe first aid or NBC kit or something like that, where you just want to bam, pop it open, be able to get to everything really quick. And my only concern obviously would be that the zipper could potentially fail eventually, and then your bag would just spill open. But um, you could of course loop through the molly here if you bring shoelaces or a paracord and kind of zip it, tie it back together that way. So I wouldn't be too concerned about it. Pretty good pad here. I really like this stuff. If you haven't seen this before, it's super tight so that it actually creates a space in here for airflow. Man, that type of thing makes a big difference, especially somewhere out here where it's incredibly warm, getting that airflow back there. Um, how many times have you guys, if you've ever rucked or done any backpacking or something like that, you know the feeling of taking the backpack off and your back is completely soaked in sweat feel the airflow on there. So that really helps. Pretty decent uh, kidney pad there and the straps for the waist. All in all, I would guess that this is a pretty comfortable pack to go uh, rucking in. It would probably be a great bug out bag if it's big enough. You know, maybe one for the special lady friend or a kid. I would probably need one much bigger than this, but great for camping or hiking as well. I might use this for some uh, camping trips where I'm gonna go hiking as well. Really cool, definitely interested in trying that out. It's kind of a, uh, it looks more green in the photo, but here in person, it's definitely more of a coyote tan. I'm not sure why it's coming up kind of greenish in the video, but that's cool. I'm going to try that out. Florida Gators were 11 and 2. Go Gators. Yeah, that was a, this was a really solid season, man. I am happy with it. I will say that I didn't get to watch the, um, the bowl game, <coughs> excuse me, uh, live. But I was following commentary and some other people posting about it. And uh, it looked like Trask was having a little bit of trouble with his passes and stuff um, at the beginning of that game. But uh, I'm not too worried about it. Probably was just out partying or something the night before. Wasn't feeling too good. Everybody has off days. Season results speak for themselves. 11 and, or 11 and 2 overall with our only losses. One of them to the team that is, in my opinion, going to win the national championship. Been crushing everybody, which is LSU. They've been doing great this year. Georgia also did very well. They kind of faltered at the end there. But, um, yeah, two good teams, so pretty cool. The handle, oh, I already read that. You can use it to drill holes in wood, and the sharp part of the eye is to punch out pegs for the hole you just made. Interesting. But, um, I mean, it would be very hard to punch out. I guess you could go right to the edge of a block of, of wood like this or in the corner of the log and just hammer it down until you got to a uh, the whole peg out and then, or actually take a square probably stick and then shove it in there and then hammer it down and make some pegs. Pretty cool. So you could build all sorts of, you know, cots and all sorts of crazy structures out of that with, with holes and pegs. Pretty cool. Definitely some good bush crafting material there. Lightweight baby, lightweight. Nice. What's up, Tom Lee? Somebody tell me they get the reference. To, I mean, I know the phrase where people yell that while they're powerlifting and stuff like that. Where they're like, wait, wait, baby, wait, wait. But something beyond that, you're going to have to explain it to me. Sorry, Marshall, I got nothing as well. Ronnie Coleman, AK. Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. So I know the Ronnie Coleman and the powerlifting reference. But everyone says that now, so I couldn't remember that specifically that it was Ronnie Coleman who may have started that. But uh, I definitely know that, yeah, the reference. In your opinion, who makes a good survival boot or what would you suggest? To me, that a lot of that comes down to preference. I mean, if you get stuff like Red Wings, a lot of the military boots like Danner, those are all good, solid boots, if, if not a bit expensive. I really like um, trail running shoes. So like Merrill and some of these other brands, they're a lot lighter weight and they're still pretty rugged. They're not going to be as as you know robust as a really good pair of leather boots, but um, they are very comfortable. They're very lightweight. And so I think those are, and you can get ones that are waterproof and things like that. So a lot of those good uh, 
just reputable boot brands like Red Wings or um, Wolverines or um, are Wolverines decent? I remember they used to be, but I, for some reason, I think they may have sold out to like Walmart or something like that and make like entry level shoes now. But uh, yeah, Danner still makes good boots. And uh, yeah, so check those out and then just try a few on. And uh, I, I really don't at this point prefer the full size like military style boot. They do offer the most protection and uh, probably will last the longest, especially if they have a full leather upper, but they're expensive, they're heavy, and they're, they're not as comfortable to do to wear all day, to go running, to climbing, if you fall in the water, sorts of stuff like that. Wolverine sold out of it. Yeah, I was suspicious about that. I remember back when I was a kid that they were pretty solid, I think, but now I think they just have like, um, kind of went for the mass approach, mass appeal approach. <clears throat> Killdozer shirt. Hell yeah, guys. Killdozer shirts. I'm, I love these things, man. If you know any buxomous women or totally jacked dudes who want to make a few bucks taking some uh, and can take good pictures, want to model these for me, I'm looking to get some done. Timberland. Yeah, Timberland's another one, I think, that, um, I don't know, though. See, every, every time I come across Timberland, they're just used as like a fashion boot for like New York guys who just like wear them with the with open tongue and the laces flopping around. I don't know if that of that many people who use Timberlands for outdoor wear. They totally might, but I have I just haven't seen it. Tim Solo, yeah, I don't really know if they're all that great when it comes to like outdoor ruggedness and reliability. But um yeah, I'm no boot expert. Yeah, uh, Red Wing. Yeah, exactly. Those are the ones that I know are solid still. And then you just got to try the different models for to find out what your preference is. You know, look at – I would come up with uh, top three things in terms of what you're looking for um, when it comes down to, like, temperature. Obviously, if, whether you're going to be in a really cold climate or really warm climate makes a big difference in what type of boot you're going to get. If you get a full leather, insulated, waterproof boot and you're wearing it around – Florida or even around here, your feet are going to be totally sweaty and um, probably pretty uncomfortable. You know, on the flip side, if you get a jungle boot with the canvas upper and the little ports and you're trying to trudge around in the snow, your feet are going to be soaking wet and frostbitten in no time. Yeah, look at things like whether you want a steel toe or not and um, all that stuff. And then just uh, try to find the best one that you can afford and keep good care of them. And they should last you a long time. Not that many boots are waterproof and last. Yeah, there's not that many left. And if you if you really want a good pair of boots that you can make last 10 years or something like that, I would expect to pay in like the $300 range, honestly. And if they do, if you really take care of them and they do last 10 years, and that's totally worth it. That's only 30 bucks a year. But you are going to be paying initially. So don't you can't be stingy about it if you really want a, um, a pair that's going to last you through a zombie apocalypse. I have Rocky Steel Toes boots, good shit. Yeah, they're another one that I think are pretty much just like a Walmart level. They're not bad, but I wouldn't trust them. I mean, like you look at things like um, if the sole is glued on to the upper versus actually sewn on. The ones that are glued on, which is a lot of them these days. Like I said, you're really going to have to probably go into the $300 range to find something else. But the glue is going to um, be a lot more likely to fail than the sewn on sewn on can actually be repaired to or resold even where um you can just put a whole new sole on it and not have to pay for a whole new pair of boots whereas you can't really do that if they're glued on you can repair them with like shoe goo and stuff that's not the same thing Wilco used to be premium chinesium that was marketed as usa but ended up with the execs in jail for berry compliant fraud ah yeah so i for those of you who don't know berry compliance is a um series of uh I guess things you have to meet where all that has to basically be made in the U S. So if you're going to sell to a um, military or certain law enforcement or federal agencies, you have to meet the very compliance standards to be able to, to sell to them. So basically they want everything made in the United States. So if you're very compliant fraud would mean that you are saying that it's made in the United States and it's really not. My dad's union at work. He gets a boot in Align it, align it, 150 so I get his old boots. Oh, a boot allotment maybe? I don't know. Any survival fiction books to recommend? Sure, I like, I mean, you probably heard me talk about these before. The um, Lucifer's Hammer is one of my favorites in terms of survival fiction. Really cool, gripping story about a comet that's sort of like a, um, what's that movie? 
deep impact type situation where the comet is catastrophic and destroys so much of the infrastructure in certain areas that there's like a huge shit hit the fan scenario. And um, I really like that one. I like um, Patriots. It's kind of like survival porn, it's a little goofy at times. Needs an, He needed an editor probably for that one. But in general, I do really enjoy it. And I've read it multiple times. Um, if you look at, I think it's Apocalypse, no, uh, Quantum Storms is pretty good. That is about a um, like massive solar flare, not like EMP type stuff, but where it's going to totally fry the entire surface of the planet. So people have to try and like, go underground or something like that pretty pretty beefy sci-fi novel and that uh that's pretty good so those are good i like those are the only ones i have read lights out that's decent too um lights out and one second after wait have i read lights out i've read one second after by william fortune is the one i'm thinking of that one's decent recommend that one as well i don't know if i've actually read lights out which who, who wrote lights out Lights out. Am I thinking of something else? Am I going crazy? Oh, David Crawford. I don't think I've read this one. I don't think I've read this one. Lights out. The guy loves FALs. Okay. Mark Karate Man Turner when he lights go out of most of the free world. For those of you guys who read that, was this the one where... There was one of these that had a guy overseas and he had to come back on a boat. He ended up losing his arm because it got burned really bad, I think. Sorry for spoilers. Let me know which one that is if you've read both of those books. I think that was either Lights Out or One Second After. I think he was one of the characters in One Second After. Okay, so feel free to think. Do you remember if that was One Second After? 870-1911 saying it was not Lights Out. So I probably have to read Lights Out then. I know I've read One Second After. I can recommend that. Um, it was fun, yeah. I'm reading A Last Babylon as an apocalypse book. It's chilling. Never read One Second After. Okay, so it must have been that one then. Pretty sure that was it. But yeah, so those are good. Those are solid. I recommend that. Um, the um, I've read the first of the... The hell's that guy's name? This series of books about um, oh, I can't think of it. it. Has like the picture of the United States on the front. It's about when gun laws get really strict or some kind of like civil war. What the hell is that? Guy? I think he was like a um, Green Beret. What the hell is that? Nate, not Nation Divided, something like that. Oh well, you guys are gonna have to help me out with that one. It's like a solid color book, like blue or red and it has a picture of the United States on it. I think the, am I going to have to go grab this off the bookshelf? One of you guys will know what I'm talking about. It's a, uh, that one is pretty decent. I've read the first in this series. I've got the other two, Matt Bracken. Thank you. And it is, what's the name of the book? The first one, that one I've read. Not a nation divided, but something like that. Dies the fire by Sterling is good. I've heard of that one. I've heard of that one, but I've not read it. Let me look up Mac, Matt Brack. My memory, man, I'm telling you, I've got the old timers to see. Navy SEAL, okay. Knew he was Spec Ops, or um, but I couldn't remember. Enemies Foreign and Domestic. Then he's got other books, Enemies Domestic, The Reconquista, and Foreign Enemies and Traitors, which I have purchased both of those books, have yet to read them yet. But Enemies Foreign and Domestic was pretty good. I have also got the, what's up, Thrifty VG? I've also got the follow-up to Patriots and haven't read that yet as well. I've just started it, but haven't read it yet. I recommend everything I've read by Bracken. Pretty cool. Yeah, I did enjoy the first book. That's, I mean, enough that I got the other two. I just haven't read them yet. So it's pretty cool. All those books I can recommend as being at least enjoyable. And um, you can probably try to find them at the library. No easy day. Let me see if I can look that. Let me look this one. I'm going to add some of these to my Amazon list. So I don't forget them. Dies the Fire was the first one that was recommended to me. A novel of the change. Pretty cool. There's a trilogy of those. I might add that to my list of books. And then the other one you got was No Easy Day. I'll check that out as well. But yeah, some of the favorites that I have read, like I said, Lucifer's Hammer, 
um, Patriots, Quantum Storms, and the first Matt Bracken book, and uh, Lights Out. Those are all decent survival fiction there. At least decent. Some were excellent. <clears throat> no easy day. So they reference Cliffs of Zahone by Bracken is good. Kidnapping of Irish girls by North African pirates. Interesting. Oh, this is No Easy Days about the first-hand account of the mission that killed Osama bin Laden. Pretty cool. We're talking specifically about like a, a survival post-apocalyptic fiction right now. But I might check that out as well. If you like into that sort of book, one book I really or those sort of things was uh, Bravo Two Zero is really good. And um, Bravo Two Zero is about the British SES guys behind the lines in Iraq. That was cool. Um, and the um, the one by Carlos Hathcock. What is the name? I think it's just American Sniper. No, not American Sniper. That's a new one. It's um, what the hell is Carlos Hathcock's book called? I'm gonna have to look that up. I think it's just Marine Marine Sniper. Is that it? Southern Miss is greater than LSU in Florida. I don't know about all that. Marine Sniper 93 confirmed kills. Yeah, that book was pretty interesting too. Yep, Marine Sniper, that's the one I've read. Cool. So I, I found that one very interesting as well, Marine Sniper. And um, Bravo 2-0, those are both good. But those aren't, like I said, those aren't survival or apocalypse fiction, but some pretty crazy stuff in, in those books as well. Marine Sniper, there's another one, different author. Yeah, this was the one, let me see, is by Charles Henderson. It's the one I read. Marine Sniper by Charles Henderson. Explosive true story of a Vietnam hero. Not too big of a book, you know, easy to get through, but very interesting nonetheless. And if you guys are just into Panic in Year Zero, and I've seen the movie, was that a book as well? Oh, yeah, I know you're joking. Don't worry. <coughs> <coughs> If you're into just crazy books, some of the ones that I enjoy reading are the ones about like prison camp experiences, like um, the um, Aquariums, of Pyong Aquariums of Pyongyang. And I forget what the one was called where the guy about written by the guy who was actually born in the South or in a North Vietnamese, sorry, North Korean prison camp. He was born in a North Korean prison camp. His entire life up to that of at least adolescence or young 20s was in a North Vietnam or North Korean prison camp, which is insane. Those things are totally insane. If you just never need to feel good about your life, pick up one of those books and um, you will not feel so bad anymore. That is wild stuff. Escape from Camp 14. That's what I call it. So yeah, I've read the Aquariums of Pyongyang, Escape from Camp 14. Those are both good. There's a big war on military board as usual. Squids versus jarheads. Yeah, I saw it. Is Marine Recon greater than Navy SEALs? I don't know, you know, I mean, like they don't get into as, as much stuff or you don't hear about it as much. And the Navy SEALs certainly like to talk about everything they do. So, uh, you know, tough to say. But when it comes down to it, man, other than the actual like door kicking type stuff, the guys with the most skills, whether that be shooting, tactical skills, um, um, martial arts are just the guys who do that stuff on their own time. No matter how much they training they give you for Navy SEALs or Green Berets or Marine Recons or something like the combatives, you're not going to beat a guy who goes to the gym and does that stuff three or four days a week for 10 years. They just don't ever do actually that much training <laughs> as someone who's just really into it as a hobby. So, um, you know, but some of the stuff you just can't do on your own, like learning to clear rooms with 10 other people and stuff. I mean, you can try to get that stuff or shooting off grenade launchers and stuff like that. So there is something to be said for getting into special forces for sure. <laughs> but if you want to be good at that stuff, even if you are in special forces, you've got to train it on your own too. And a lot of those guys do. That's why they're such stone cold badasses. But my point is you don't necessarily have to be Navy SEAL to be good at all that stuff. Yeah, so read any Star Wars books or any genre or just fan type of shit. Yeah, I don't read Star Wars stuff. Like I said, I don't read a lot of fiction, actually. I do enjoy some fiction. I really, what I really enjoy, like, I, I um, are kind of memoir type books of people who've been through crazy shit. So, like, these people who are in prison, specifically, prison is really interesting to me. It's kind of like a fascinating and a terrifying way. So, like, prison and gang stuff and these prison camps or escape from, you know, 
prisoner of war type situation. That stuff's all super fascinating to me. Um, I like reading books about economics and, you know, self-improvement, stuff like that. Um, true crime and things like that. Um, some fiction is fine. I do. I've read one or two of the Jack Reacher books, which are good. I've read a lot of the Clive Custler books as, as a kid and um, stuff like Edgar Rice Burroughs like the, and the original Conan novels and the Pellucidar and Tarzan stuff. That's all really cool. Um, very antiquated or archaic language used in those. And I actually learned, I remember I read the Edgar Rice Burroughs books at a time when I was still kind of learning to read. So I would have to like look up or skip over a lot of the words and just kind of get a general gist of it when I first started with a few of those, because it was, they're pretty, um, they used a lot of ver or a lot of uh, adjectives and things that are not used in modern speech very often, like referring to um, an elephant as a pachyderm specifically, instead of just saying an elephant. So like now I know that shit, but um, still interesting, just be ready for that. So if you're not a particularly strong reader, those might be a little rough to get through or just seem weird and stilted compared to modern terminology. Old books, Great Gatsby, Huck Finn, Times, Tom Sawyer. Yeah, I'd liked, um, I'm, I need to read a lot more of the older fiction. One of the ones I specifically, not, oh, this is an older, but another fiction that, that I specifically want to read because it's been, become so highly recommended by everybody is some of the Cormac McCarthy books. A lot of people that I uh, really get along with and respect their opinion about stuff always thought those books were great. So I'm going to read a couple of them. So just reading Raven Rocks about the government's survival plan for nuclear war. That's pretty interesting. What's up, Spasmit? Happy New Year to use as well, you as well from North Dakota. You know what? I'm going to have to visit your neck of the woods one of these days because North Dakota is down, is one of the three states that I'm down to that I have not yet been to. I've been to 47 U.S. states. Hawaii, Alaska, and North Dakota are the only ones I have left. I have plans, not concrete plans, but specific plans to hit Hawaii in 2020. Uh, me and my girlfriend are saving up for that, so that should be fun. Um, they just started to do direct flights to Hawaii from Vegas with Hawaii Air. So you can get there anywhere from 300 to 400 bucks, which is pretty cool. Or 300, 450, 500-ish max. A direct, which is pretty cool. So that'll make it a lot easier. Brain, is it available on audiobook? Who you oh, Brian. Um, maybe. Look around. Look at Audible. You know, um, like I said, what I definitely recommend is if you have more time than money, um, do the library, man. It seems like a haven of scum and villainy and pants shitting schizophrenics. <laughs> the library does, but it does serve a purpose. And I've saved a lot of money over the years going to the library. Another tactic that I use is to buy, a, if they go on Amazon, if it's a popular book that has a pretty high ranking on Amazon, then just buy a used version and you can sell it back directly on Amazon and you make back most of what you paid, you're usually only out a couple bucks. So you don't have to go to the library and or drive there or try to turn back in. So if you have don't have that much time, that's the way to that that is the way to go with it. Excuse me. Is it true you left Florida when Tebow left? No, it is not true. He left well, when did he specifically leave Florida? If you mean when he left UF, then no, I was there for much longer after that. But if you mean when he left Florida specifically, I don't know when that is. But uh, I just left Florida not that long ago, two and a half years ago. I think it'll be three years when I get to around July, end of July, August will be the three-year mark in Vegas. And I, I really like it. I know I've said that in a lot of my videos before. I really enjoy Vegas a lot. I'm digging it. Now I just need to get friggin' rich. That's all I got left. But I really like it. I grew up on a small farm near Fargo. Cold winters. Cool, man. Yeah, definitely cold. We well, what's he say? Well, dig up some dinosaur bones. Yeah, man, out in North Dakota, every atheist has it their biggest weapon. What the dinosaur bones? You look too normal to be from Florida. <laughs> First of all, I'm not that normal. I've I've actually joked with some of my friends recently that like, I would always be kind of weird, like in Florida or Gainesville or anything, but um. Here, it's impossible. In Vegas, it is impossible to be the weirdest person in any given location. There's no way you can do it. So um, no one will bat an eye at whatever things you're doing that you think is weird. But in Florida, I was, I was a little weird for Florida. But the thing about Florida is you hear a lot of stories coming out of there. They're out of a few areas. And Florida has so many people that like just 
statistically speaking, most of the stories are going to be from California, Florida, New York, Texas anyway. So I don't really know that Florida has that much more than their fair share. Do get some, excuse me, some weird stuff coming out of there. I think part of it's related to the fact that the warm weather means you can have craziness all year round. Whereas in New York, people got to kind of tone it down a little bit, keep their craziness indoors. <laughs> There are lots of retarded people in Florida. There's a lot of retarded people here, too. Honestly, I would say the stupidity level overall is much worse here. Craziness level in terms of, like, wild aggression might be higher in Florida, but the stupidity level here is unquestionably higher. Florida man does it again. Arrested. Yep, Florida man. And now it's become such a meme that anytime it's from Florida, people share it more than they would if it was from somewhere else. It's like, oh, here you go, Florida, Florida man. Solar Storm 123, Marcus Richardson. Is that another book? Or are you counting down to the Solar Storm? Solar Storm 1, no, I'm looking at it. Solar Storm 123 is not on Amazon, so I'm not sure. Oh, Solar Storm Books 123. It looks like he has up to book four and five now. Pretty interesting. I think that you said those are decent. Might check them out. I kind of want to do a contest, we'll give something away, and have people like write little short stories and just kind of make a compendium of them. Should be pretty cool about like prepping. So, like, what do you think about this Virginia Second Amendment nonsense? I mean, obviously, what the governor is doing is nonsense. It's completely unconstitutional. What they're trying to do is completely unconstitutional. I really, like I said, the the, the swift response from the sheriffs. And the um, is very heartening. I don't think anything too crazy is going to happen there because they really don't want the big igloo, so to speak. Um, and like, but like I said in my last video, this stuff is is going to happen at some point unless we get lucky and there's some sort of breakup before the people that really feel strongly about that actually end up doing some sort of a significant uh, overreach in terms of gun control that we're going to have something like that happen eventually. It's just a matter of time. My first experience with survivalism was after Katrina. Man, yeah, it, it, that is awful. It's not that it's a meme. It's a crime or action that the Florida man did. <laughs> yeah, no, but I mean, there is a meme. Like Florida man has become like a meme. Seals and recon do lots of swamp training out of Eglin and Jacksonville. Yeah, the, the um, ranger school used to, right, do this, the swamp phase in Eglin. Too as well, or I mean the um, didn't they? Am I, am I crazy? Swamp phase wasn't in Eglin. <clears throat> I think so. I did not go to Ranger School, but I do remember that the swamp phase was in Florida somewhere. Yep, Eglin. At least it was as of. 2015. So now I think uh, they do transgender sensitivity training during that phase instead, if I'm not mistaken. <laughs> Probably, unfortunately, a little close to being the truth. But yeah, so um, what, do, what do you guys have some goals for um, preparedness for the coming year? I'm going to have to take off here in a minute, get my workout in. It is already 8 o'clock here. But I appreciate you guys watching. Got a pretty decent number of people tuning into this one. I will be making some more videos coming up in the near future as well. I really want to stay on top of that. And um, do you recognize the Air Force as a service? <laughs> yeah. Uh, we always make fun of our other branches, but it's all it's all good with me. The Chair Force. They pro provide a useful um, part of the military service as well. I might have to go back into the Space Force, fight some aliens. But thanks for watching, guys. If you don't mind, please smash the like button and stay tuned to the channel as well. Check out rulethewasteland.com if you need your killdozer shirts. If you need to talk to me for anything in particular, you can email me at rulethewasteland at gmail.com. Thanks again, guys. I will talk to you later. Join a gym and actually go. I have a home gym, and I do actually go. Pick a Bronco. Yeah, I, um, I don't have one here but I will make a video about it soon. So stay tuned. Thanks guys.